Tom Beat Award for the best alto sax man of 1951. Thank Congratulations you. to you. Thank you. Charlie Parker, a famous jazz musician, died 69 years ago. But recently, his family shared some sad news that confirms old rumors about him. Did you know that Parker struggled a lot with drugs? Many people loved his music, but they didn't know about his personal problems. The life of a jazz musician is a difficult life because you want to play, you want to be, you want to get to the inner spirit and sometimes you drink or you use drugs or you smoke a lot. You do all these things to try to get the spirit. Some say he wasn't a great person behind the scenes and wonder if his talent was worth the pain he caused himself and others. His dark side made him less likable. How did his drug use affect his life and career? Let's take a closer look at the truth behind Charlie Parker's life. When I hear Charlie Parker, what goes through my mind is the epitome of what jazz is supposed to be. Charlie Bird. Parker was one of the most amazing musicians of the 20th century. He changed jazz forever during his short life, which lasted only 34 years. But his life wasn't easy. It was full of struggles, including drug problems. Even his famous nickname, Bird, has some mystery behind it with different stories about how he got it. Some people say that the name Yard Bird, often shortened to Bird, came from a cousin who couldn't say Charlie right and called him Yarly instead. Another story says a fellow musician gave him the name after Parker saved a chicken that had been hit by a car, took it home, and had it cooked for dinner. But the story that seems the most likely is the one told by a musician named Clyde Bernhard in his book, I Remember. Clyde said that Charlie got the name Yardbird because he loved eating chicken, no matter how it was cooked, fried, baked, stewed, you name it. In the southern part of the U.S., chickens are often called Yardbirds, so that's probably where his nickname came from. Bird had those experiences similar to the ones I had, you know, elementary school band, starting an instrument early, those things, you know, music was very strong back then, and it's, uh, that's part of being in Kansas City, having a strong instrumental program. Charlie Parker's full name was Charles Christopher Parker Jr. And he was born on August 29th, 1920 in Kansas City, Missouri. Though life was tough for him, he left a huge mark on music and people are still celebrating his work today. In fact, even though the pandemic has made it hard to have big events, people are celebrating what would have been his 100th birthday with online concerts, new releases of his old albums, and even a graphic novel, all part of a project called Bird 100. Parker's childhood wasn't easy. His father, Charles Sr., was a gambler who drank a lot, and according to Parker's third wife, even worked as a pimp. His father left the family when Charlie was just nine years old. Later, when Charlie was a teenager, his dad was killed in a fight after being stabbed. Even though his dad was a troubled man, Charlie still inherited a love of music from him. By the time he was 12 years old, Charlie was sneaking around the alleyways behind the nightclubs in Kansas City. It's, it's inconceivable to, to imagine a Charlie Parker being born in Oklahoma or Philly or any place else and being able to, to nurture his art on that level. And not, not that there wasn't great jazz going on in Philly or a lot of other places. He was trying to hear jazz musicians play or catch a glimpse of one of his heroes, the saxophone player, Lester Young. Parker began playing the saxophone at age 11, and at age 14, he joined the Lincoln High School Band where he studied under bandmaster Alonzo Lewis. His mother purchased a new alto saxophone around the same time. Parker's biggest influence in his early teens was a young trombone player named Robert Simpson, who taught him the basics of improvisation. When you have all these, this row of clubs, and they're going all night long, seven days a week. Parker withdrew from high school, joined the local musicians union, and decided to pursue his musical career full time. Parker started playing in local jazz clubs around Kansas City. He often joined jam sessions, which are times when musicians play together without planning ahead. He was ambitious, always wanting to play with more experienced musicians but that didn't always go smoothly. Now something happened when Parker was just 16 years old. This story has been told many times and even shown in movies like Whiplash. But what really happened? At the time, Parker got a big chance to play with Count Basie's band at the Reno Club. 
It was a huge deal for him because this band was very popular. However, things didn't go as Parker planned. While playing a solo, Parker made mistakes. He kept losing his place in the music, which frustrated the other musicians. Joe Jones, the band's drummer, was especially angry. I came from an era that was, was very unforgiving, too. And I know that just from listening to my father and his friends. Now here's where the story becomes a bit exaggerated. In the movie Whiplash, it shows that Joe Jones threw a cymbal at Parker's head, almost hitting him. But that's not exactly true. According to Gene Ramey, a bass player who was there that day, the real story was much less dramatic. Parker was making mistakes, and Joe Jones wanted him to stop playing, so he hit his cymbal hard to get Parker's attention. Jones didn't throw the cymbal at Parker. Instead, he dropped it at Parker's feet to make him leave the stage. Even though it wasn't dangerous, it was still embarrassing for Parker. He looked upset, and many people thought it was sad to see him react that way. But Parker didn't give up. Before leaving the stage, he confidently told the band, I'll be back. Don't worry, I'm coming back. This shows how determined Parker was, even after being humiliated in front of everyone. Instead of letting this moment defeat him, he used it as motivation to become better. It was their, their heyday. They tell us about the all-night jam sessions in the Reno Club where you could buy, buy reefer in it and, you know, and stuff. That's part of the menu. Parker left Kansas City and moved to the Ozarks, a quiet area where he could focus on improving his skills. He started practicing obsessively, sometimes playing his saxophone for up to 15 hours a day. This period of hard work transformed him into one of the greatest musicians in jazz history. His dedication to practice and his refusal to quit made him the legend we know today. The neighbors threatened to ask my mother to move once when I was, when I was living out west. I mean, uh, they said I was driving them crazy with the horn. I used to put in at least 11, 11 to 15 hours a day. Yeah. Parker also had some big changes in his personal life. At the same time, he married his high school love, Rebecca Ruffin. His life started to take a dangerous turn. Parker, still very young, got involved with drugs, and it wasn't long before his wife noticed something was terribly wrong. Rebecca Ruffin later shared how painful it was to watch her husband begin using heroin. She told Parker's biographer, Stanley Crouch, that one day she saw him using one of his own neckties to tie his arm tightly before injecting heroin. It was a heartbreaking moment for her to see the man she loved falling into addiction. Sadly, their relationship couldn't survive Parker's drug use and they began to drift apart. Ruffin ended up raising their son Leon on her own as Parker left home to chase his dreams of being a musician. Parker traveled with a Kansas City band to the Ozarks, a region in Missouri, for the opening of a resort. On the way there, Parker was involved in a car accident. He broke three ribs and hurt his spine. Despite this serious accident, Parker returned to the Ozarks the next year to keep practicing and working on his music. Parker's journey to becoming a famous musician took him to Chicago first, but later he moved to New York, where he hoped for better chances. At just 18 years old, Parker had no money and had to take a job as a dishwasher at a Harlem restaurant called Jimmy's Chicken Shack just to survive. His life in New York wasn't easy at first. When he met musician Buster Smith, Parker was in bad shape. His legs were swollen and his shoes were falling apart. Buster Smith felt sorry for the young Parker and let him stay at his apartment for six months. He also gave Parker a chance to play with his band, helping him out during a difficult time. So, unfortunately, caught up in the habit that he had, but it had nothing to do with his personality, and it comes out in his music, as you can hear, on the beautiful records he made with string. I always say that that is Charlie Parker, as Parker began to play more, people quickly started noticing his incredible talent. One pianist, Earl Hines, who worked with Parker during this time, was especially amazed by how determined Parker was to improve. He remembered Parker always carrying a notepad with him, writing down ideas on how to play better. This showed how serious Parker was about becoming a great musician, even while he was struggling in other parts of his life. Parker's big break came when he joined a swing band led by Jay McShann a pianist who gave Parker room to grow as a musician. Parker played many memorable gigs with McShann's band at the famous Savoy Ballroom in Harlem. One of his most impressive moments was in April 1941, when he played a solo on a song called Hootie Blues. 
His unique style was beginning to shine through. And it was clear that Parker was not just an ordinary musician. He had something special. However, Parker's restless spirit led him to leave McShann's band in search of something new. He joined a more progressive and modern orchestra led by singer Billy Eckstein. This step took Parker into the world of bebop, a new style of jazz that he would later help shape. Parker later said that he had been bored with the same old ways of playing jazz and that he was always searching for something different. That night, while practicing Cherokee, he found what he had been looking for. He began playing higher notes and creating new melodies and it felt like he had come alive. This was the beginning of Parker's groundbreaking style. Although Parker's life in New York City was falling apart, he struggled with drugs and alcohol, which made his problems worse. Parker had a huge appetite and his eating habits became extreme. He often stuffed himself with multiple Mexican meals before performing. There were even stories of him eating 20 hamburgers in one sitting. His chaotic lifestyle filled the pages of his biographies. For example, there was an incident where he threw a saxophone out of a bedroom window and another time when he walked into the ocean while wearing a brand new suit. Musician Quincy Jones remembered meeting Parker during this rough time. He described Bird as sweating a lot and wearing a white shirt that didn't quite fit. One button was off his shirt and I could see some of his meat, Jones recalled. They got out of a cab in front of a worn down apartment building and Jones felt on top of the world. I was hanging with Bird. I couldn't believe it, he said. But the story took a sad turn. Parker tricked Jones into giving him money to buy drugs and then disappeared. Parker's home life was just as chaotic. He married Geraldine Scott in 1942, but he was never officially divorced from his first wife. This marriage didn't last long either. In December 1946, Parker decided to go to Los Angeles with another jazz legend, Dizzy Gillespie, for a series of performances. But Parker sold his return train ticket to buy heroin, which meant he wouldn't be coming back home. Although his music with Gillespie was amazing, captured in the album Bird and Diz, his personal life was in shambles. In September 2020, Z2 Comics released a graphic novel called Chasing the Bird, written and illustrated by trumpeter Dave Chisholm. The book tells the story of Parker's tough times in California, including when he recorded a powerful version of Lover Man while so high that he could barely stand, let alone play. Charlie hit a low point in his life, he was arrested and charged with indecent exposure, resisting arrest, and even suspected of setting a hotel room on fire. After this, he was sent to Camarillo State Hospital for six months. During his stay, he received treatment from a psychiatrist who happened to be a fan of his music. Dr. Richard Freeman, the psychiatrist, said that Parker was a man who only cared about enjoying life through music, food, sex, drugs, and excitement. He believed that Parker's personality was stuck at a childish level and that he didn't feel much guilt or responsibility for his actions. Freeman mentioned that the only reason people cared about Parker was his incredible music talent. Without that, no one would bother helping him clean up his life. Parker's reputation was complicated. Many saw him as deeply troubled. A drummer named Stan Levy even called him a sociopath. But despite his problems, Parker managed to pull himself together and create one of his famous jazz songs, Relaxing at Camarillo, which was inspired by his time in the hospital. After leaving the hospital, Parker went back to New York and created some of his best music. But his personal life remained difficult. He tried to settle down with Doris Sidner, a woman he met at the Three Deuces Jazz Club. They got married in 1948, but their relationship didn't last long. Within a year, they had separated, and Parker started dating Chan Richardson, a white woman. Despite her mother's warnings, Chan stuck with Parker. They had two children together, a daughter named Pri and a son named Baird. Even though Chan took his last name, they never officially got married. Sadly, Parker's drinking problem kept getting worse. He often got into fights, collapsed in the street, and was even banned from Birdland a famous jazz club that was named after him. Parker also tried to end his life twice after arguing with Chan. He was sent to a psychiatric hospital for help, but his troubles never fully went away. In the biopic Clint Eastwood made in 1988, drugs were his downfall, but it was just one part of the story. One thing that stood out was his mixed-race marriage with Chan. 
Back then, in the 1950s, society wasn't ready for that kind of relationship. But Parker and Chan tried to live their lives without making it a big deal. However, their relationship did catch attention. A black magazine called Ebony decided to do a photo special about their mixed race relationship. It was unusual at the time because segregation was still strong in the US. When the magazine was published, Parker's first wife saw it. She was upset and filed charges against him because he hadn't been paying child support for his son, Leon, for 14 years. Parker admitted it and he was sent to prison. This event made things even harder for Parker. At the time, the New York Police Department had something called a cabaret card license. Musicians needed this card to perform in the city. The police would take away these cards for even the smallest mistakes. This rule was often used against black musicians like Parker, Billie Holiday, and Ray Charles. Without the card, Parker couldn't play in New York clubs, which hurt his career. In February 1953, Parker wrote a heartfelt letter to the New York Liquor Control Board. He explained how losing his cabaret card was affecting his family. He said, my right to work has been taken away and my wife and three children are suffering. He asked them to give him another chance, showing that he was trying to be a good husband and father. Charlie Parker was one of the greatest jazz musicians ever, but in his last years, things started to fall apart. By the time he was performing outside of New York in 1954, Parker was rusty and out of shape. Jerry Mulligan, another famous saxophone player, heard him perform that year and said it broke his heart. Mulligan explained that while Parker still had energy and control, something important was missing, a gentle side that he used to show in his music. One of the hardest moments in Parker's life came when his two-year-old daughter, Pri, passed away from pneumonia in March 1954. Parker was in Los Angeles at the time, playing concerts at the Tiffany Club, and this tragedy hit him hard. He adored his children, Pri, her brother Baird, and his stepdaughter Kim. In 2015, Kim Parker shared stories about Parker, describing him as funny, loving, and full of life. She said he liked toys, magic tricks, ice cream, and watching westerns on TV. One of her favorite memories was when a pigeon pooped on his head while they were walking in Washington Square, and he simply laughed and greeted the bird, calling out, Hi, you bird! Kim also believed that Parker's heavy drinking and drug use took a toll on his body. When Pre died, it pushed him into a downward spiral. She felt that Parker blamed himself for her death, thinking that his lifestyle had somehow harmed her. Not long after Pre's death, Parker and his partner Chan separated. From then on, his life became chaotic. He was often homeless and was constantly using drugs and alcohol. His friend Jay McShann said that with the way Parker was living, it was only a matter of time before things took a turn for the worse. He had started depending on money from a wealthy jazz fan, Baroness Panonica de Koenigswarder, to get by. One day when he visited her at the Stanhope Hotel, he complained about stomach pain and asked for ice water. He began vomiting blood and was given antibiotics by her doctor, but it was too late. His body had been through too much. I was on the bandstand at the California club on a Monday night in Los Angeles. We took advantage of the fact that Bird had died to announce to the people that we were going to take an extra, extra long intermission. That we proceeded to go celebrate Bird's death uh, by doing the very thing. After taking some time to rest, Parker started feeling better. But on Saturday, March 12th, 1955, something unexpected happened. He was sitting in the home of a baroness, watching jugglers perform on a TV show by Tommy Dorsey. As he laughed at the show, he suddenly started choking and sadly passed away. When the coroner examined his body, he thought Parker was around 60 years old, even though Parker was only 34. Years of hard living, drug abuse, and health problems had taken a toll on him. Parker's death didn't come without more drama. A strange battle took place between Doris, his common-law wife, and Chan, the mother of his children. Both wanted control over Parker's body. This fight over his corpse caused his body to be moved from one funeral home to another. Parker had once told Sean, don't let them bury me in Kansas City, but sadly, that's exactly what happened. To make things worse, the date on his gravestone was wrong. In 2020, an opera was written about Parker, highlighting the strange fight over his remains. The opera was written by saxophonist Daniel Schneider and poet Bridget Wimberly, 
showing that even after his death, Parker's life story continued to inspire art. Doris, who was married to Parker, said in 1993 that she hoped he wouldn't just be remembered as the most famous junkie of his time. Luckily, her wish came true. Today, people remember Parker for his incredible talent. His music has influenced many famous people, including playwright Harold Pinter, actor Alan Akeborn, and comedian Marty Feldman. Even Rolling Stones drummer Charlie Watts was a huge fan of Parker. When Watts was just 20 years old, he wrote and illustrated a children's book called Ode to a High Flying Bird, dedicated to Parker. Parker was a master of improvisation. He could play fast, complicated music, and beautiful, slow ballads. Some of his most loved songs include Summertime, All the Things You Are, and Scrapple from the Apple. Fans on Spotify especially enjoy these songs. One of Parker's best performances was at Massey Music Hall in Toronto in May 1953, where he played with other jazz greats like Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, and Max Roach. In this concert, Parker used a white plastic saxophone because he had pawned his brass one for money. Many people have honored him through music. For example, in 1959, writer Jack Kerouac made a special poem for Parker with music in the background by Steve Allen. Later, a saxophonist named Aaron Johnson recreated some of Parker's most famous songs with strings in 2014. Other musicians like guitarist Joe Pass and the group Weather Report also made albums in Parker's honor. Even famous composers like Moondog wrote pieces dedicated to him. There are also events that keep Parker's memory alive. One big celebration is the Charlie Parker Jazz Festival held every summer in New York City. Another is the annual Charlie Parker celebration in Kansas City, which lasts for 10 days and includes music, tours, and more. Miles Davis, another jazz legend, once said, you can tell the history of jazz in four words, Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker. This shows how important Parker was to the world of jazz. Even though his life was short, his music will live on forever. Parker's daughter, Kim, once described him as a supernova that burned bright and then was gone in a flash. Charlie Parker may have had a troubled life, but his music and talent are remembered today as some of the best jazz the world has ever heard.